What a joy to be here. And uh, I said earlier this morning, uh, Greater Vancouver is known as a church around the world. And you, I know you know that, but sometimes it doesn't always sink in. But it's a joy for my wife, Tina, and I to be here. She, it depends on how you ask. She's my wife, my girlfriend, and uh, hopefully it's still my girl. She's still my girlfriend after all these years. And uh, we're having the time of our life. Our kids are now all grown. We have four daughters and uh, my wife. Until recently, we even had a poodle. And so uh, God delivered us. And uh, so I know the Lord's about to draw nigh. We got rid of the poodle. And, uh, but when they gave us a poodle, it was even a girl. So I didn't have a chance. And, and so I, uh, have you ever tried as a man to look really cool walking a poodle down the road? It's not very macho. And so I just wanted a real dog. So uh, at any rate, uh, no more poodles, but uh, it's, I could go on and on there. The, the young men and ladies at the life thing, they could tell you a few things about our poodles. And I tried to give them away, but thankful for each of them. I got rid of her before we came here. And uh, it's great to be free, free at last. Okay. Um, we'll be in Second uh, Peter chapter 1 there today momentarily, but Pastor, thank you for the privilege that you've allowed Tina and I to be here, and Brother Jeremy, Miss uh, Hannah, uh, my hat's off to you. I don't know where they're at. Are they even here today? I didn't know if they were sleeping somewhere. Uh, I told everyone, if you took everybody in church and you laid them end to end in each of the pews, they'd be a lot more comfortable. So they may be up there laying end to end, just catching some rest. But uh, as a church, you are very blessed to have uh, Jeremy and Hannah uh, just absolutely mind blown to see all they're doing, the organization and the love they have for these young single adults. I, I'm not saying this to flatter you. I, I don't know that I've ever been at, in a place where I've seen better young people anywhere. And again, church, I, I think you understand what I'm trying to say. As an adult, as a parent, um, God has blessed you. And I know good young kids or teens and children and young adults don't just happen. It's through years and decades of the men and women who've stayed put. I, talking about feeling old, I remember, Brother Lawrence, when you were a young kid. And so uh, I asked him how long he's been teaching. You were not even married. And uh, just I, it's mind-boggling. I just love to have a tenth of his energy. And uh, Brother John Mark doing a great job. And just all these guys were kids or young people and now... Um, leading the way, and I, I'm excited about the future, aren't, aren't you? Just to, the music today, to the, the, the young men and women that just, they're all in, and God will bless that. I want to speak to you today from First Peter chapter number, uh, or excuse me, Second Peter chapter number one will be there momentarily. Um, and before I get started, if, if the Lord allows, I've, I've got a message tonight I'd like to share with you. Maybe I'll share a little more about what we will be doing, my wife and I. And if you could be back tonight, I, I, I believe the Lord will use the message. And uh, my desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that I can. But we cannot uh, top the Word of God. That's why we came here today, not to be entertained. And I'm certainly not that. I'm certainly not a, a dynamic preacher. I know the preachers you've had in the past. Uh, but man, I want, I want the Lord to meet with us today. Second Peter chapter 1. We've already read the passage, and I appreciate so much, Brother Mac, reading that for us, but we'll, we'll read verse number one. He says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray, if you would, with me before we get started. Lord, we ask today again, as we did a few moments ago, that you would meet with us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that we've uh, been able to see and hear today. Thank you for those that worked so hard over the last several days and weeks to prepare the music that we've enjoyed from the choir and from uh, the ensemble just moments ago. 
And Lord, I ask that you would soften each of our hearts. And Lord, that you would work in my heart, first of all, that you would empty me of self. And Lord, that we would get out of the way so that, Lord, you can uh, be first and preeminent in all we say today. Lord, I ask that you also forgive me of any sin that could be present. And Lord, I, I've tried to search my heart. And Lord, I, I want to be right with you so that I can deliver the message you've laid on my heart. And I pray today that you would also fill me with your spirit. And Lord, we'll thank you for that, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, as we've read this passage earlier, uh, earlier in the service, I believe each of us today have been given everything that we'll ever need for this journey called life. Everything that you and I have need of. Often we look at others who have maybe nice homes or nice cars, nice clothing, a perfect family, perfect job, perfect education, and we always look at individuals and think, if I had that, I would be content, I'd be happy. You and I know where that goes. That's not the truth. That's not the key to uh, happiness. But I believe everything that you and I will ever have need of for this journey called life uh, in preparation for uh, uh, bringing honor and glory to him, I believe he has already given us everything we'll need. Everything. We're going to be equipped. Have you ever taken a trip and you went to your car, you went to your vehicle, you went to your, 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 your luggage, and you went to retrieve something that you had need of, and you went in there, and it was not there, and then you ask your, your husband or your wife or you kids, you ask your parents, and where is this? And then you realize, oh, no, I forgot it. Now, if it's a minor thing, it's okay. But being a teenager and you find out on Monday you forgot all of your clothing for the week, it's going to be a long day. And a long week for the counselor and for the rest of the cabin. But, but spiritually speaking, have you ever considered that all that you will ever need, the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior, you were given everything you'll ever need. I think you'll see it in scripture here as we look at it <clears throat> in uh, verse number one as we've read. I'm going to start real quickly, just very basic today. I believe that when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have, first of all, his divine power. We have his divine power. He says there in verse 1, And our Savior, Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior. My question today, is he your Savior? If he is your Savior, if there's been a time you've opened your heart and said, Lord, I need you to save my soul and my spirit. Lord, come in and make me a new man. When we have received that, we have received none other than Jesus Christ, his divine power. Now, with that in mind, I want you to hold your place in First or Second Peter chapter 1. Go with me back to the New Test Old Testament and go to Psalm number 73, if you would, with me, please. Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Is this water okay for, for me? Okay? All right. I, I don't say this to be uh, disrespectful. One time I was doing a funeral for it, not a Baptist, and I was brand new in the ministry, and I did not know what that water was for, and I drank it. And I was the gasp through the crowd, and it was it was uh, quite humorous to me, but it was not to everyone else. Thankfully, they forgave me. Thank you for the water. All right, I'm not going to go there anymore. I can joke around with teenagers, but I don't want to get in trouble with their moms and dads. So Psalm 73, and uh, if you would, let's in our mind picture we're, we are a teenager. We are a teenager who is not perfect. We are a teenager who is in trouble yet once again. We are a teenager who does not make the good grades. We are a teenager that might have these electrical, electronic gadgets. This, let's just suppose that were each of us today. Psalm 73 the psalm here of Asaph, some say that Asaph wrote this on behalf of David, but we, we know of Asaph and the psalms that he's written. He was like Pastor John Mark up here leading the music. He was the worship leader. And here he, in verse 1, he says, truly God is good to Israel. And we would have to say amen. He's been good to each of us as well. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such are, as are of a, a clean heart. 
So he's saying, church, God has been good to me. And if I were to take time today to ask testimonies of each individual, you perhaps could say, Pastor, let me tell you what God has done for me this week. My wife has started to journal as we started traveling since January, and she's labeled it her miracle book. It's not that she's on the road working miracles. We're not doing that. But she's logging these things that God has done for us. And it's so humbling to look over and over and over again. Nobody knows the need that we have, and all of a sudden, the need is met. Aren't you glad we have a heavenly father that knows your needs and he supplies your needs. He said, if we being evil know how to good, give good gifts to our children, how much more shall our heavenly father give if only we ask? So we have his divine power. In Psalm 73, Asaph says, truly God is good. And if we took time to praise him today, we would take up the remainder of the day. But I want you to look in verse number two. He's bragging about how good God is. God is good. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh, can you say that word? Slipped. Have you ever slipped? Have you ever tripped over something? You're walking and all of a sudden you you trip. It can be quite humorous, quite embarrassing. It can hurt. But he's saying here, he said, God has been so good. But... If we were teenagers today, and I don't know your wording, I've already been, I have a message I preach about taking out the trash, but I've been told that that's not proper English here, it's garbage. And so, and so you're going you're gonna to teach me how to use good English, and I'm Southern as they come, and I will, I will mess up big time, and my wife, I call her a grammar Nazi because she's always on me for talking wrong. Please forgive me, she's doing the best she can. But how many times have we as children or teenagers or maybe an adult, we're bragging about how good God is, and then the next statement we say, but, and then we start saying what all is wrong. If we were a teenager today and you had a cell phone, let's just say every one of us were teenagers, we had a cell phone, and your grades came out, your reports came out, and the teacher sent home and your mom and dad saw your report card. Maybe dad hadn't seen it yet, your mom had got it, so you're still alive, you're okay, but when dad gets home, you know trouble's a brewing, okay? And it's not their fault, it's our fault because of our grades. So you have your cell phone, and perhaps just for illustration, we say to our friends, hey, I'm not going to be able to text you for the next few days or the next week or the next month because I've lost my cell phone. We didn't technically lose it, we know where it's at, we lost it because of not our parents being bad, but because we were bad. It's because of our grades. And if our mom were to cloud up and rain all over us, we, we use a word or a, a phrase uh, it, it, down where I'm from. And if a mom and dad are upset, if you can help me, I'd be grateful. So any of the young adults or the teens in here, or maybe if you're young at heart as an adult, what is it something mom or dad would say to their child or say to us if we're in trouble? We'd say to our friends, hey, my mom and dad are what would we say they are? Would you say, some would say, they're upset, mom and dad are mad, I'm grounded, I, I'm in trouble. Here's what we say, and it, it's not proper English, I know, but we would say, my mom be tripping, okay? <laughs> they're tripping, okay? In other words, she's flipping out on this, so I can't, I can't text you anymore, so man, I can't, you understand, every teenager understands that, man, I'm not going there. And then maybe, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's mom and dad found out where you're going to go this weekend and they knew who you're going to be running around with this weekend and mom and dad says, that's not happening. You have to call your friend. Hey, I can't go. Mom found out. Dad found out that we were going to go this place and they said, no, we can't. They're tripping about this, okay? Asaph is saying, truly God is good. And we would all say, amen, he is good. But then he says, but... My feet. Look what he says there in verse number two. He says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. You know what Asaph was doing? He was stripping. What was he tripping about? What was he stressed out about? And we have all been there. Asaph was the man who, who wrote the songs and the praises uh, to God. He was that leader. 
reminded himself in Israel that truly God is good. But like we do often when we have a difficulty, I'm not going to be able to do this because somebody's, they're, they're having a fit. In Psalm 71, God is good. And if God is good, why are you and I today tripping? I think you and I understand that God has been good. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you and I, we have his divine uh, person in our life, Jesus Christ. In verse number one, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Is, do you have his divine person? Is he your personal Savior? Thank God if you do, like, like the psalmist said, he is good and we have every reason to praise him and the devil's going to cause all kinds of things in our life where we're tripping over things that really are no big deal. If you don't do it, I encourage you to start a journal like my wife has just to show how good God has been to you. Because at the end of the day, when we be tripping, you'll look back and say, truly God is good. Devil, look at this. Get away from here. God is good. God is faithful. Even though I don't deserve it, truly God is good. So let's remember, if we have received Christ as our Savior, we have his divine uh, person. Number two, we also, if we've received Christ as our Savior, we have his divine power. His divine power. And could I say before I move forward, when I say we have his divine power, could you put in parentheses, we have his, his divine power, batteries included. Have you ever bought a gift for a child or for someone or maybe yourself and you unpackaged it thinking the batteries are going to be there and they were not included? When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you have his presence in your life, his divine person. He lives within you and you have his divine power. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So today, if you know Christ as your Savior, truly God is good. I don't have to stress about what's going on in my life. God's got it all under control. I have have his divine power and so do you in verse number uh, two and three he says in verse two grace and peace be what's the word grace and peace be multiplied I, I don't know if you're very good at math I'm not great at math but I'll come back to that but he says grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus uh, our, our, our Lord you will never have, a, have peace until you exercise his grace with things going on all, all around you. And people look, how did you contain yourself? How did you not overreact? How did you not get uh, stressed? How did you not start tripping? It's because his grace was present in your life. It was a big deal and it was a burdensome thing, but you had his divine presence and you had his divine power and you didn't let Satan get one up on you. Here's the point here. When you have five plus five, what do you have? What do you have? Five plus five is, that's what it is where, where I live, okay? Five plus five is, is, is 10. Now, there's not one of us that wouldn't, if I had a $5 bill and, and, and I had it and you said, oh, here's another one. There's not one of us that would say, hey, that's a pretty good deal. I'll take it. But would you rather have five plus five or would you rather have five multiplied by five? And that's what he's saying here. Look, look, I'm not reading anything into it, but he says here in verse number three there, he's, or two, he says, grace and peace be what? So when we accepted Christ as our Savior, we've got something that the world can't even fathom. Men, they like to buy their muscle cars. They like to have a big engine under their hood. They like to rev it up and show what they've got. But I want you to know, when you accept Christ as your Savior, you've got power that the world they cannot match. And we have his grace in our life and his peace that is multiplied. Have you ever needed his peace? Have you ever gone through the storm? Have you ever faced a situation like the disciples did and they were going down or Peter stepped out on the water, he was going down and he had God's grace magnified in his life when he, Jesus reached down and he pulled him out. And we know what he told him, but my response to people who say he, he failed, at least he got out of the boat. What would God do in our life? What could he do in our life if we let his grace and, and peace in our life be multiplied everywhere we go? It ought to be evident we have his divine power in our life. And uh, when you have this thing, in verse 3 says, according to his divine, what's the word? 
It, it, again, this is not just some cute idea of a thing. Of, yeah, we have his divine person, Jesus Christ. But in verse three, we have his divine power. You and I have been empowered. And I don't know if you've ever gone to use your cell phone and the battery was dead. I don't know if you've ever gone to turn on a, a flashlight and the batteries were dead. How many times have we gone to use some type of mobile device and there was no power? Batteries are dead. You and I do not have to go through life with our batteries dead spiritually. He lives with inside of you and greater is, more powerful is he that is in you than anything you and I are going to face in the world. So number one, we have his divine person. Number two, we have his divine power. And number three, you're doing great. Let's go to verse number four. That power, uh, uh, the power of the person, I believe, is connected to the person you possess. So when you and I like, lack the power, it's because maybe we're trusting something else, someone else. So number three, I believe when we've received Jesus Christ as our Savior, he gives us his divine presence. Verse number four. He says in verse number four, he says, whereby are given unto you exceeding and great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the, the divine nature. In other words, you and I, when we receive Christ as our Savior, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. We have his presence dwelling with inside of us. That's why he tells us that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why when we do something that doesn't please him, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. But you and I, we don't have to leave here and, and go out and be overwhelmed by what we face because we have his person as our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have his power, greater is he that is in you, and we have his divine presence, regardless of what you're facing, regardless of the storm. He says we're partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world uh, through lust. When we accept Christ, we receive a new nature at salvation. And I'm not trying to correct anything, but in my, again, very simple mind, I want you to imagine holding in your hand a little mustard seed. Jesus talks about them. He said, this kind cometh not by, but by prayer and fasting. He says, just mustard seed faith. I believe when we get saved, all of us are given these things in seed form. In other words, he tells us that we're to grow. Remember the analogies that Jesus uses when he talks about the seed and as the word goes out, we know the word is the word of, uh, the seed is the word of God and the word of God is the seed. And so the, my point is the seed of the word of God is the same everywhere it goes. The word of God is powerful. It will never return void. So when it goes in, people that trust Christ, that seed fell on soil that accepted it. The word of God may go out and people reject it. Again, that soil our, our heart is that soil. My question is, what condition is your heart in? Because the seed's going to grow if it's given a chance to grow. You and I, as a child of God, if we've trusted him, his divine presence in our life, I want you to just imagine with me in seed form. You plant a seed, and then tomorrow you don't go back and say, oh, I wonder where that corn is. I planted it yesterday. It ought to be growing. I'm, I'm looking to eat corn tomorrow night for dinner. No, you plant it, and agriculturally, we need to be thinking about, hey, now, you, Paul, Paul makes comment about this, uh, and Jesus made comment about that, and Paul referred to it, uh, some watered, some, some, some planted, some watered, some, but God gave the increase. So you and I, if that seed is in our heart, it's the same for every one of us. It's in seed form. You and I, like any seed, we need to allow it to grow. Everything that you and I have need of, Pastor, we have when we get saved. Jesus Christ. Why do some people seem to grow and others do not? It, I, I, I'm just, in my mind, it could be a condition of the soil, my heart. And so, it may be the Holy Spirit wants to do something. You've got his divine person. His power is there, but it's like the light switch is on the wall. If we go over there and turn the power switch off, the lights are still there, but we have turned the power. And if we limit what God can do in our life, it's not going to be revealed on what he is doing, and we're going to become like Asaph. We're going to be tripping. So my question to you today, is the seed growing? 
It's awesome to watch a little seed break that ground and begin, whether it's a mustard seed, whether it's a little acorn, and you plant that, you see that thing planted. You can take an acorn and you can put it, and it can get under any crack in a sidewalk or driveway, and that little acorn, as it begins to express itself, that seed, there's life inside that seed. There's as much life inside that seed as there is in each of us and that seed expresses itself when it breaks through. And when Jesus Christ comes in and you and I begin to be multiplied, that seed begins to express itself and you and I grow and others say, that's what I want in my life. We are the light of the world, he says. So in the bottom line, as growth processes I believe it's necessary for the seed to unveil all that it has to offer. I'll, I'll, I'm about finished here, but what, what are you hungry for? We all have different appetites. We all crave different things. And at this time of the day, is not the time to be talking about food because all of a sudden we're thinking, I want to go get some of that food. I went last night with uh, Pastor Paul and my word, I, I have never had a better fish taco in my life. It was phenomenal. I love food, and so we enjoy that. But what are you hungry for? Without, again, just bear with me, pigs are hungry for slop because that's what's in their nature. You can wash that pig, you can bathe that pig, you can put curls in that pig's hair or bows in that pig's hair, but you put slop out there, the pig's going to go right back to it. Why? It's in their nature. And so the same application for you and I, I want to ask you, you don't have to verbalize your answer, but what do you do? If we saw a bird today fly, we would not be blown out of the water by that because we know birds are made to fly. Birds fly. It's in their nature. Something is wrong with a bird that doesn't fly. Hey, what, 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 what uh, you take a fish and you take a fish, a big fish, and you pull that fish out of water. Is it still a fish? Yes, but is now removed from its environment. It's going to be flopping around. It's alive, but it's not going to flourish in that. It was made to flourish in water. You and I, God gave us a group called the church to be part of, and we will flourish. We will grow in that environment, and then we leave from here, and we're the light of the world. So the seed needs to grow. Our nature our nature affects some things. Our, our associations, when you trust Christ, if you get saved as a teenager, as an adult, there's going to be some associations that you'll probably need to change. Our appetite for things will change. I'm not talking about the things we eat, but I'm talking about the things spiritually that will affect things as far as our testimony, our behavior, our environment will change. And so I'm not going to go into the rest of it, but if you drop down to the, the other verses that we read earlier, all the way down through verse number seven, let's read verse five and then we'll read it and I won't go into all of it, but I, I've got another sermon I preach on these are the seven vitamin supplements that every Christian needs. And here it is, verse number five, it says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. While, while uh, recently, last summer, uh, we were viewing the eclipse down in Oregon where we live, and it was pretty incredible to see all that take place. And they were talking about, they use this phrase, D divine totality. I heard it over and over. They, these are lost people talking about you've got 100% or divine totality. And I thought about, hey, I've read that in scripture somewhere. Do you realize we have more than the eclipse could ever do? And when Jesus Christ came into our life, there was a major solar eclipse that took place. He washed our sins and he covers our sins. We don't have to have it brought up anymore in our life. Has he done that in your life before? We've got these vitamin supplements that I've, I've uh, phrased, and I encourage you to study them out and uh, see if you're growing. Why do we take vitamin supplements? It's because we're lacking in something. The vitamins do not replace anything. They do not replace the seed in our life, but they're meant to complement. That's why we need to be in the Word, feast on the Word so that we can grow. So as we finish today, are you growing? Do you have his divine person? Do you have his divine presence obvious in your life? Is his divine power obvious in your life?